So although we can do confidence intervals rather easily using our TI-84 calculators, um, the, we, can, we should also understand where it's coming from, be able to do it manually. So the formula for estimating a population value, the population mean, is just to go get a sample and then depending on um, what confidence um, we're interested in, 95% or 90%, um, 98%, that's going to affect um, a number of things. So um, if we're trying to estimate the mean, the population mean, then this, um, this margin of error that we're going to get is going to be, um, if it's 95% confidence, it's going to look like this. Um, so this is at 95% confidence level. And if it's um, at some other confidence level, 98, 99, that's going to change things. So it'll be some z value. Um, and that z value is going to be a function at, um, at some level of confidence. So um, this one is easy to remember. 95% confidence, but at the other levels we're going to, can, we can use a table, but we're also going to see how we can use inverse norm um, to figure out what those, what that z-value is. Um, also, another way of thinking about this is that this is, um, the margin of error is the z-value times so-called standard error, where we're calling this the standard error. So let's dig into it a bit. Um, recall that uh, sampling, um, for example, IQ from a population, every time you take a sample, x1, another sample, x2, another sample, x3, and so forth, you'll end up forming a histogram, and all of those values are going to be great predictors within the actual population value. The larger the number in your sample, the less error and the more likely you are to kind of sit here nice and snug around the actual population mean. Um, and the reason that's the case is that as you increase in the sample size, this entire value, the margin of error, gets smaller. So, so that margin of error is really a margin of error of the sample when it's trying to predict the mean. Um, right, when it's trying to predict the population mean. So let's start with, with this picture here. What we know is that um, based on, you know, if we use the empirical rule, it says that um, when you have a normal distribution, 68% of the data will be found within one standard deviation. 95 will be within two standard deviation, um, and 99.7% will be found within three standard deviations. So it's not actually two, and it's not perfectly 68, and so forth. So those are nice round numbers to work with. All right? So that was the empirical rule learned early in the semester. The actual value is 1.96. Um, and so, but if we wanted to figure out what this value is, um, the way that we have learned to do it should have been seen in a previous, in the previous video, is that if I know an area, then I can figure out the corresponding, um, Z value or the number of standard deviations that correspond to that. Um, so in this case, since that's 95, that means that the left must be 2.5% and the right must be 2.5%. The way um, inverse norm works, 
If I want to know what the z-value is, he asks you to take the area to the left and input that in. And so we should have seen previously that the z is going to be um, inverse norm 0.025. Um, and you'll find that's a negative 1.96. Um, if we round off, I think it was... Um, so we just round off the two decimal places. So we can find that z value for this one. Area to the left here to get the z value would be inverse norm. Since this is 2.5 on the right, everything on the left must be 97.5. So it would be an inverse norm of 0.975 or 90. Um, actually, 0.9. 775, right? It would be the 1 minus 0 0.025. So 0.975 is what give us is what would give us the 1.96. So the area between negative 1.96 and 1.96 is 0.95. Um, and you can plug that in and verify that that's the case. You go in, second distribution, normal CDF, and if we go from 1.96 to 1.96, um, that one's positive. Let's go back up and make the other one negative. So that's a negative 1.96. Since we're working with z values, that z, standard z curve, has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And if we plot that, what we get is the 0.95, as expected. So given that our samples um, can be converted to a z value, right? If I have, for example, a sample of students of size n is equal to 50. Let's say that I have their IQ of 105. I get another sample of students and maybe their IQ is 103. Each one of those can be converted to a z value. And that z value would uh, be something like whatever that sample is minus the mean, which would be the 100, all over um, the standard deviation, that would be 15 for typical IQ standard deviations, and by the square root of the sample size. 95% of that time, 95% of the time, that z value is going to be between negative 2 and positive 2. Um, so that's a characteristic of the normal distribution, it captures um, your your samples 95% of the time, meaning, or at least um, each time you take a sample, 95% of the time that sample will be, will be within two standard deviations of the mean for that curve. Um, and so for this particular curve, right, with z equals 0 here and um, mu equals 0 and then z equals 1 and then z equals 2. Um, we could figure out each one of those those values. So assuming we understand that each sample has a corresponding z value um, let's take it the next step. That z value is going to be calculated by this calculation here. And so if we just look at this as a statement here, right, the probability of some random event um, we're going to isolate just that statement and work with that statement. Um, the truth of that statement can't change. The algebra can't change. The logic can't change. So I'm just going to work with this mathematically 
everything that's in the parentheses. So if what I'm trying to ultimately do is work this so that we solve for mu, we solve for um, uh, the population mean, and you'll see see how that helps us determine the confidence interval. Um, so I'm trying to solve for mu, so I'm going to multiply both sides um, by the square root of n over sigma. And if I multiply all three, one, two, three, um, what you'll see is that this becomes um, so I'm going to multiply all three by actually let's do it like this. We'll multiply this by sigma over the square root of n, and I'll do that throughout. So that makes this sigma over the square root of n. It makes this also sigma over the square root of n. And so what we're left with is just that difference here. So again, I'm trying to sign, uh, find mu, solve for mu. So let's um, remove this by subtracting the mean from both sides. And so what we end up with is that this is Um, so if I subtract the mean from both sides, then I'm looking at um, a negative x bar. I'm going to subtract x bar from both sides. So that leaves me with minus x bar here and minus x bar there. And then I have my negative 1.6 still. Um, plus 1.96 and then that's going to be times sigma over the square root of n sigma over the square root of n and so that leaves us just with um, negative mu here on the inside And so if we finish this up, um, there's one thing left to do. Um, with something like this, let's say you have a negative 2. We know that negative 2 is um, it's greater than negative 5. Um, and it's less than, um, negative 2 is less than, let's say, positive 3 or positive 4. Since I'm trying to solve for mu, I'm going to have to multiply by a negative. So remember, when you're multiplying by a negative, throughout, everything changes signs. Um, and then you also have to flip the inequality. So 2 is certainly greater than negative 4, and 2 is less than 5. Had I not flipped those inequalities, we would have, um, it would have said 2 is actually greater than 5, and we would have had problems. And then finally, I can just kind of rotate this and put the negative 4 on the left. So 2 is greater than negative 4, and 2 is less than 5. Um, so we're going to do something like that. with what we're looking at here. We're going to multiply both sides by a negative 1 so that we're looking at x bar plus 1.96 
sigma over the square root of n. Um, we're going to change the direction of the inequalities and multiply through by negative And finally, usually with intervals, um, when we're looking at a value 3, that's um, this value 3 that might be uh, greater than 2, but less than 5. We normally start with the smallest value. Um, We we'll normally start with the smallest value on the on the right, and you won't typically see something like this where we have three is less than five, but three is greater than two. So the convention is to show this interval from left to right, and it has a certain intuitive feel to it. So I'm going to change this and have the smallest value on the left, um, and that means I'm going to take this and rotate that one over and rotate that over so that you end up with mu being greater than x bar minus 1.96 and then x bar less than mu less than x bar plus 1.96 So that's the random event, and the probability of that random event happening we're carrying that 95% through. So notice that this is an interval where you have x bar plus or minus um, 1.96 times the standard error or sigma over the square root of n. So what this is saying is that the probability that for any sample that you take, the probability that mu can be found within that interval for a sample of that size n is going to be 95%. Um, so the probability that mu is found within the interval created by this formula right here probability that mu is going to be found within that interval um, is 95%. So this is the, um, the mean plus or minus component. Um, so in general, So the more general statement is um, we, as long as we know what the z-value is for some confidence area, for some percentage, um, then we can determine what the margin of error is. By that, I mean this one started at 95, um, but had that not been 95, but say 90, and we want a 90% confidence interval, All right. then Z, um, that critical value there, that um, that value of z, which was before one, negative 1 1.96, in this case it's going to be, well, given this area, what is that, it's 90, so that means this must be 5%, and this must be 5%. If I go inverse norm, 1.05, I'll get the z value for the 90%. Um, so it'll be a different z value. 
I'll show you that a little bit later. But in general, depending on the um, the confidence level that you're interested in, um, that's going to determine what C value gets used. So that's where where that's coming from. So this Z value is often referenced as so-called critical value. And sometimes you'll also see it as the Z value corresponding to alpha over two when we're talking about confidence intervals because um, right, if we're looking at, again, let's say the 95%, um, if we're looking at 95%, then what we're calling alpha is everything else. So alpha is the confidence interval minus or one minus um, the confidence interval so one minus 0.95 it's everything else um, so that is the 0 0.05 and alpha over 2 which is these two areas is going to be 0 0.025 so the z value at alpha over 2 negative and positive um, can be determined um, just by simply using the inverse norm at whatever that area is. Typically for confidence intervals it's going to be 1 minus um, the confidence level and then divided by 2. So in this case it would have been 1 minus 0.95 or 0.025 as we saw before. So let's make a, a statement. Um, uh, don't forget this could have been z at alpha over 2. As your book sometimes is more likely to reference it actually, depending on which textbook you're looking at. Um, So each time we take a sample, um, an SRS of size n, um, we're going to, let's say we're looking at IQ, we get a sample. Um, we'd expect if it's large enough, it's going to be reasonably close to the actual population value of 100. So um, it's going to vary. There's going to be some natural variation and we don't know what those numbers are going to be. But, and so that means that this interval changes um, depending on the sample itself. But the way to interpret what we're working with is that we're saying that, um, and recall that we're trying to estimate mu, and mu is some fixed value. We aren't sure what it is, but we hope to make a, um, we hope to infer. So if we, if we think about our number line, it's going this way. If we come up with a sample, that first one, that sample, and then we go plus or minus um, some margin of error, we expect that mu is somewhere in that interval. Um, and if we took another sample, like the 102, so if that first one, let's say that first one is 97, the second one is 102, and then we end up getting an interval 
and then we repeat this again, our samples are all kind of reasonable predictors or estimators of mu, and they have a margin of error. So every sample has a corresponding interval, and all of these are based on the same sample size. So the way to interpret a confidence interval is, is that if we were to um, take another sample, we can be confident that 95% of the time, right, it won't be the case all the time. Sometimes you'll take a sample and it doesn't contain mu. Right? Mu may be excluded. So 90, but 95% of the time, when we take a sample of size n, mu will be found in that interval. Um, and we're using 95%, but it's actually alpha. Um, that, right, alpha means it could be 95, it could be 90, right, that confidence level, alpha, um, it's just easy to use what we've seen since the beginning of the semester, but 95% of the time, or alpha percent of the time, when we take a sample size in, mu can be expected to be found in that interval. So to finish this up, we did a 95% confidence interval. Um, and we worked with z equal, equal to 1.96 for the critical value, right? x bar plus or minus z. Um, that determines the confidence interval. this z value is a function of the level of confidence alpha that we're interested in. So with confidence intervals, we're always looking at an interval from start to begin, start to end, start to end, and let's um, think for a second about, uh, let's think for a second about how we can figure out this z value for different levels of confidence. So let's consider, um, right, so for a level of confidence, and the corresponding z, that critical value. We've seen that for a 95% level of confidence, z was um, 1.96. What about for a 90 and a 99% level of confidence? What are those z values? Um, so if we go back to this and Again, we're looking at 90 and 99, um, and we're trying to find these z values. So this starts with identifying the remaining area, um, the remaining area for this. If this is 90, that means that 
what's left. So the 1 minus 90% is the 10%. And so we split that 10%, right? So alpha in this case equals 1 minus 90. Alpha in this case equals 1 minus um, 1 minus 0.99. Um, so the remaining area um, can be easily calculated, like the total remaining area. So that's 10. And we split that over 2, that means that's 0.05 and 0.05. 1 minus 0.99, it's like a dollar minus 99 cents, it's 0 0.01. We split that in 2, and so we're looking at um, 0 0.0. 0 0.05 to half of 0 0.01 and 0 0.005. That means then that for this first one, inverse norm of 0 0.05 will give you that z value, and inverse norm of 0 0.005 will give you. Um, that uh, that z value. So let's plug those in. So let's clear this out. See if we can quickly bring in second um, distribution inverse norm. And the first one that we're interested in is 0 0.05. And the other values won't change. So negative 1.645 um, so negative 1.645 so at 90% this is 1.645 and the next one is at 99% so we're looking at a higher level of confidence well if you open up the interval you can expect um, to be reasonably sure that you'll you'll get the the interval. Let's see if I can get out of this. Let's recall what we just put in. Oops. Recall. So let's go back in. Second distributions. Um, inverse norm. And instead of 0.05, it's 0.005. And that's a negative 2.576. So that Z value is 2.576. So when we're trying to figure out the margin of error, we're just going to get that sample and then if it's a 95% um, level of confidence, then Z at alpha over 2 is 1.96. If it's a 90% level of confidence, then Z at alpha over 2 is 1.645. If it's 99% level of confidence, then Z is 2.576. Notice that um, at the higher level of confidence, the z value gets bigger and therefore the interval itself is bigger. So if you want to catch, if you want to be more, um, have a higher expectation, higher probability of capturing the population value, um, then you're going to have to open up that window, that margin of error.
So let's finish off by looking at an example where we estimate a population mean. Um, before we do anything, we want to make sure the basic conditions that allow us to do this are met, right? That it's coming from a simple random sample, that sigma is known, um, and that the population is normally distributed or the sample size is greater than 30. So one of those has to be true, um, at least one of those. So in this case, we have a sample size. Um, let's go down, scroll down to the bottom. We're going to estimate the salary of the population of college graduates who took a statistics course. And we want to do it with a confidence level of 95%. And we're going to, we were able to sample 41 students. We want a 95% confidence level. We turn um, the average salaries of those four students was 67,200. Um, and sigma is known, so we can apply our method. Um, so the short answer is that the actual population value is going to be 67,200 plus or minus some margin of error. And we just need to figure out what that margin of error is. Um, since it's 95%, we know that the margin of error is 1.96 times sigma um, all over square root of the sample size or 1.96 um, times 18,277 divided by 41. So if I punch those numbers in, um, 1.96 So 1.96 times 18,277 divided by um, the square root the square root Forty-one. Oh goodness. So one point nine six times eighteen thousand two hundred and seventy seven divided by the square root of the sample size gives us fifty five ninety four point six zero. So if I add my 5594, so the answer should be 67,200 minus the margin of error, which is this value, and then 67,000, so our interval, and then let's draw these square brackets to indicate that it's an interval. So it's plus or minus 67,200 plus the margin of error. Let's punch those values in quickly. 67,200 minus and then 67,200 um, plus and that is our range of values. 61,605 Um, and then all the way up to 72.794.6. So the actual population of folks who took a statistics class, um, you'd, expect, you'd expect the average value to be somewhere between 61,605 to 72,795. Um, 
and then finally using our calculator to do the work for us let's go in under stats go over to tests um, it's a the Z interval and the value that we're going to use for Sigma is the 18,277 the mean is going to be 67,200 and we get 61,606 and 72,794 um, so we're off by a dollar or so I think that's because the actual value of 1.96 should be 1.95889 I think so we did some rounding off but it's um, it's fairly accurate but we um, are going to get the most accurate value if we keep more significant digits but we're in agreement um, what you see here on your calculator is in agreement with what's here Now, what if I want greater accuracy? How about if I want 99% accuracy? Um, I want, so that means I'm going to try to get more um, confidence that my mean is contained in the interval. Um, and so the, the way the math works out is that we end up widening or opening up our interval. So for this last one, as we finish up, I'm just going to use the calculator and have it do the work for us. So go under stats, tests, and let's do a Z interval, number seven. And the only thing we'll change is the confidence level. And what you'll see is that interval goes so that it's this one gets smaller and the other one gets larger. So it goes to 59, 4, 8, 8. 59, 8, 4, 8. All right, so that's smaller. And then uh, 7, 4, 5, 5, 2. So if I want greater confidence, I'm going to have to open up that margin of error. And that margin of error is very much a function um, of the level of confidence that we're trying to get. But in summary, this is the formula that you're going to use. And where this here is sometimes maybe marked like this, where this is the standard error of the mean. Um, so, um, so this works for the mean, but what about if we want to get um, an estimate on who's going to, or how the country's going to vote for a particular candidate? That's a sample proportion, um, and we'll see sample proportions um, next. And sample proportions certainly follow a similar pattern. Um, so. I'll see that for the next time.